Hello. Let me walk over there on this very sturdy and stable ground. Uh oh. Ah! There's no collision! Let me turn on my flying gear. Thankfully I got these installed a little while ago. I guess there wasn't collision. Collision is one of the most important parts when it comes to playing video games. Without collision, games would be unplayable. Simple things like standing, shooting a weapon, or interacting with objects wouldn't be possible without collision. For any of you somehow confused about what collision is, it makes it so objects can't just pass through each other. It stops and pushes away the player, just like woman did to me. Nah, I'm just joking. I don't talk to woman. Or leave the house for a matter of fact. I haven't seen the light of day in the last three months. Anyways, as of right now, the player is able to walk wherever they want, and fish wherever they please. Since there is only limited space on my map, the player could walk infinitely in any single direction to never return. I need to trap the player in this cage so they can't escape and fish for the rest of their life. <laughs> there were many different methods to making a collision system. Some methods worked on only circle to circle collision or rectangle on rectangles. But for my game, I need something to work with polygons. This is so I'm not limited to a very blocky environment, because that wouldn't be fun if you can only walk in four directions. I finally found a method that would work the best for my game. It's a method that's also used by many other games, called Separating Axis Theorem, or SAT for short. This can get pretty boring, so I'll try to explain the logic behind this quickly. Imagine that there are two shapes right next to each other. From this perspective, it's very easy to tell that they aren't touching. But how does a computer tell by only using the location of the shape's vertices? For this, we're going to have to go into the third dimension. From here, we're going to walk around the shape and try to find the spot where the objects don't look like they're colliding. From here, they look like they're touching. Same with here. It's still touching here. Oh! There's a gap in between the objects here. This means that the objects aren't touching. All it takes is for there to be one gap and the objects are separated. Now, with this information, let's go back to the top of the shapes. Now imagine that there is a light that is infinitely far away shining down on these shapes. Wow, that's a strong light. We then need to look at the shadow that the shapes are casting. If the shadows are overlapping, there is a possibility that these shapes are touching. If there is a gap, then the shapes aren't touching. But where do we shine the light? We can't shine the light in infinite times around each object. That would be way too much for the computer to handle. Instead, the light is shined perpendicular to each corner's edge. And if it finds a gap, then it will return that the objects are separated. To achieve this using math, it requires a lot of complicated stuff like dot products, vector projection, and other scary math stuff. But I won't explain that all here. If you want to learn more about it, there are many great videos describing this in way more detail. Great, now we know how to implement the separating axis theorem, but as of right now, we can only test whether the objects are colliding. Now we need a way to push back the player if they're inside the object. For this, we can go back to the shadow example. From here, we can compare the overlap distance and direction between the two shadows. Then, we need to find the smallest overlap and push the character back that much. We need to find the smallest overlap so the player doesn't get pushed to an unexpected spot. There, now we have a working collision system. The players push back the appropriate amount to make it look like they're running into a wall. Well, f So far, I've only had one collision object at a time. I need a way to store the collision data so it isn't a long list inside the code. I decided to save the information in a text file called collision.col. Each row makes up a collision polygon that is a set of four world coordinates. There are also different worlds that I need to account for, as each world will have different collisions. For this, I need to find a different way to identify each world's collision data. I don't really feel like making a new collision file for each world, as I don't like the idea of there being a huge amount of files. Instead, my idea was to have the row that started each world collision to say its world name. Then, at the beginning of the game, the program would parse the file and add it to a collision list. This list would only load the current world's collision, as there would be no point to keep the other data in memory. Then, when traveling to each world, the collision object would update again. Great, now that we have a collision system, I'll just make it so that the fishing bobber can only be placed inside the collision object. Now the player can't place it anywhere the character would be able to walk. This works perfectly until I try to catch a building, which isn't very realistic. I mean, neither is a world full of pixels or dirtfish, but hey. The bobber should only be able to be placed inside water. To do this, I need to differentiate between the water and land collision objects. I added a new variable to my collision class called collision identifier. As of right now, I only have two different types of identifiers either a blank or a null value if it's normal collision, or a W if the collision is meant to be water. This is pretty simple. All I had to do was add a simple check when the player throws down their bobber. If the object the bobber collides with is water, then cast away. 
otherwise don't. They both block the player movement, but the water collision allows for the player to go fishing. Now we can also change the player's cursor to notify them when they are hovering over water. But now, how do I identify the difference between water and land inside the collision.col file? I added the collision identifier at the beginning of each row. Now when loading, I'll find the identifier by looking at the characters that would happen before the open parenthesis. Then add the identifier to the collision object. But now, how do I know the difference between each new world's identifier and the collision identifier? I could check to see if there's an open parenthesis in the row, otherwise it's a world identifier. But for some reason, I didn't think about this method until now. The method I thought of was adding an exclamation point before the world's name. So now I could just check the first character in each row. If it was an exclamation point, then it's a world identifier. And if not, then it's a collision identifier. All right, now the collision works perfectly. I can no longer go off and frolic in an infinite void of blue. But the bigger the world gets, the scarier and scarier the collision file gets. I need a nice way to edit the collision objects without trying to figure out which row the object is and finding the new coordinates. So I kind of made a whole collision engine in a day. This code probably isn't the cleanest because I didn't think it would ever see the light of day, but this program allows me to do a few different types of things. Ooh, I can fly. Firstly, it allows me to add collision objects. The points are instantly put into the collision list. Then once I save the collision, the file will be updated. Secondly, I could drag and drop the points where I want. No need to find the coordinates anymore. I can now line it up to the map. I can also change the collision modifier by clicking on the collision object. This will then change the collision box to blue. This means that it's water. Otherwise, it's normal ground collision. I can also delete objects by right clicking. Finally, I can also undo movements by pressing Ctrl Z. This function is a little broken and can sometimes crash the program, but it's okay because I'm not releasing the software. Thankfully, I could stand on the floor without falling through it, but now I can't go swimming. Well, I guess I have to figure out what to do until next video. Oh, and make sure to watch this video if you haven't already. Bye bye! Wait, I can't leave. I'm trapped in this box. The code to change it is on the other side of this wall. Help! Help! Ah!